and welcome to the final of the inaugural Ross Ihaka Lecture Series. My name is Julie Middleton and I'm Communications Advisor to the Department of Statistics. In that job, I've written a lot about the man sitting over there who helped turn a single letter into a global sensation. And before he speaks, there's a few things I'd like to share with you. Ross's heritage is Ngāti Kahangunu ki Wararapa, Rangitāne and Pākehā. For Māori, he's an important and rare role model in a field where we have too few Māori academics and students. His determination that R remains open source reflects a core Māori principle of working as a community for the greater good. To trace the roots of Ross's success, we need to go back in time to his paternal great-grandfather, Pirapi Ihaka. Pirapi was born in 1861 in Papawai, Wairarapa, and married an Englishwoman, Mildred Baker. They raised their family near Masterton. Pidipi believed in education, and his grandson, Ross's father, was one of the first from his area to go to high school. Ross discussed this in a 2010 Mana magazine article, and I quote, My father described going to get the old man's blessing when he went away to high school. He said, You learn everything those Pākehā have got to teach you, or I'll kick your ass." <laughs> End quote. Ross will tell you, and some of you may know, that it's a sentiment he likes to pass on to others. So Ross's father, Jack, was one of the first from his area to go to high school, and he became a teacher. Ross's mum, Edna, was also a teacher, and Ross earned a PhD. As Ross once told me, these are really big steps in just two generations. At this stage, I'd like to acknowledge Ross's ancestors, both Māori and Pākehā, on whose shoulders he stands, and Ross himself. E ngā tūpuna, ngā koutou tēnei te maiti, yaki yaki, i hotohoti tana whai i ngā kete o te wānanga. Rātou ki a rātou te hunga mate, tātou ki a tātou te hunga ora. Ross, e te manukura, mō e tuku tō taonga kore here ki te ao, ko te whai o te māramatanga te take. Ko tau e whakatina na hea pēnei tiana, e hara taku toa i te toa takitahi, e ngari he toa takitini, ane a mihi karere. That translates as, those who have gone before, you encouraged your child's pursuit of education. Ross, you gifted your work to the world, your goal to share knowledge. The legacy you inherited and what you have passed on is perhaps best encapsulated in this well-known saying in Te Rao Māori, success is not the work of one, but the work of many. Thank you. I'll pass you on to Paul Morrell now. Right. Uh, sorry, I'm a lecturer, so I have to have slides. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> Right. right, Ross is um, so special, he gets two introductions. Um, so, uh, first of all, I want to clarify something, uh, just in case there's any confusion um, and you're thinking this is some sort of crazy coincidence. This is Ross Ihaka, um, after whom this series was named. So Ross is talking in his own series this evening. So this is the big one. Um, Ross is an associate professor in the Department of Statistics here. And he's probably uh, best known for um, being the father of R. Or actually, one of the fathers of R is R has two dads, the other being Robert Gentleman. Uh, so we can safely call him a, a father of R. And I want to um, just briefly mention a few of Ross's qualities through the, the prism of parenthood. <laughs> so, um. <laughs> The first point is, uh, if you've got kids, you need to put some effort in early on because when they grow up, they stop listening to you and do whatever they like. And this relates to um, Ross because this is, uh, this is his parenting manual. When, when Ross and Robert began work on R, they were looking to build a statistics program for teaching uh, statistics students. 
And so, of course, the first step they did was to read a book about how to write compilers, which is what this thing essentially is. And what the significance of that is, is that Ross's work is, um, when, he, when he tackles a problem, he tackles the problem fundamentally and thoroughly. Okay, so he doesn't just whip out something that sort of solves the first thing, he's actually approaching the general problem. Uh, and in terms of R, its success has <coughs> relied on the fact that when they started this thing, and um, it's got rather out of hand since then, when they started it, they got a lot of things right because they were doing a thorough job. So that's a hallmark of, of Ross's work. It's something we can be admiring of. Second point. When you have a child, you must let it go. You must uh, give it a chance to be independent and do its own thing and surprise you with where it goes. I suspect I was a bit of a surprise how it turned out. Um, but again, part of why that has happened, why R has become so big, is because, again, the way Ross approaches research is when he does a piece of work, he involves other people in that work, he invites them in, and he shares that work with others and licenses it in such a way that everybody can use it however they like. So the impact is as wide as possible. And again, that's in terms of R, a fundamental decision that sort of helped things to grow so big. Right, the third one. Don't brag about the kids, that's just because it's really obnoxious, so don't do it. Um, <laughs> and Ross has this completely nailed. <laughs> you will hear many more criticisms of R from Ross than praise of R. And again, that reflects um, his appropriate work ethic. He, he's not doing things like R so that people think he's amazing. He's doing it so he can do a good job. And he's concerned about getting it right. Um, however, there is one really important difference between R and human children, and that is that when R succeeded, it did reflect actually on R's parent, and um, you, don't, you don't tend to see Ed Sheeran's dad going up and getting Grammys, but <laughs> R, uh, R has meant that Ross has received uh, a couple of significant awards that I know of. Uh, American Statistical Association awarded him the uh, Statistical Computing and Graphics Award in 2010, and the Royal Society of New Zealand awarded him the Pickering Medal in 2008. Um, so, R, Ross didn't start R to become rich and famous. It's quite, quite lucky, really, because I don't think it made him rich. But <laughs> um, he, he started R so he was wanting to do a good job. And I hope that he's proud of what it's become. And now, in order to take R uh, down a few notches, I think we should hear from the man himself. So please welcome Ross E. Huck. hear me at the moment I don't have much volume to my voice so can people up the back here yeah um, I've just had the uncanny feeling of what it's like to be at your own funeral life <laughs> <laughs> people people standing up and saying nice things about you I'm also going to use some slides. Um, so this is joint work with Brendan McArdle, um, and I'll have more to say about that um, later in, in this talk. Um, as Paul observed, I always like to work 
in collaboration with people. And I think when you're working on software, it's actually very important to do that. Uh, because it provides an exchange and you can have the roles of somebody who's doing the work, someone else can sit as a critic, um, and it just provides good feedback on what you're doing. I'm a statistician. Um, it's been two weeks since my last analysis. <laughs> Uh, but that's all right because it was just using R to do my tax return. <laughs> uh, in order to explain where I come from, I need to say a little bit about what statistics is. And that means talking about what it's not. So statistics is not about analyzing data. Um, that might seem slightly surprising. Um, and it's something I try to explain to my students that statistics, um, data analysis is to statistics as driving a car is to automotive engineering. Okay, so statistics itself is kind of a deeper study than just, um, just analyzing a set of numbers. It's all about the methodology. Um, another way of saying that is it's all about the tools. Statisticians are tool makers rather than tool users. Um, this changes the emphasis of, of what I do. As a tool maker, I may produce a better hammer. Okay? And from time to time, I may encounter a nail. Um, and the thing I do is to whack that nail as hard as I can with the hammer. But my instinct on having done that is not to look at what happened to the nail, it's to take a close look at the hammer. Okay, so I'm interested in studying the tools rather than the use to which the tools are put. Um, in this talk I'll be looking at tools much more than what can be done with them. Um, so if you're expecting to see nice examples, lots of data and that sort of thing, you're going to be disappointed because I'm going to talk about tools for doing things. Um, the component parts of statistics are really statistical theory, which is where statistics came from originally. Um, it's the use of mathematical methods to study particular processes for analyzing information. Uh, computational statistics, which is about algorithms which put into more practical play uh, the techniques that the theorists devise. And then at the end, there's statistical computing, which provides kind of a container for the methodology that others have developed, so it can then be conveyed to people to actually use and practice. I work in statistical computing, and the goal in statistical computing research is to produce better tools. Well, I guess that's true of all of statistics. Um, so the primary things that we deal in are computing environments, that's the actual software that gets things done. Algorithms and interfaces, these are the tools that we take from other places so that we can use them. And graphics is really the, the, the third part of this. And these are things, I've, I've worked on all of these things, but more specifically on computing environments. So if we go far enough back, um, say the 1960s maybe, computing environments for doing statistics really consisted of forms. You were presented a form, you filled it in, you ticked the boxes, the computer took that and it carried out some analysis for you and printed out huge amounts of paper with the results of that analysis on it. Um, that's all very well. That sort of analysis is translated into GUI-style software where instead of filling out the form you know, on the keyboard, you're now ticking boxes with the mouse. But it really amounts to the same sort of thing. In the 1970s um, and into the 1980s, the focus of computing systems for doing statistics really changed to looking at computer languages. Uh, and there's a good reason for that because you can think of you know, menus and pointing and filling in forms as being the 
communication equivalent of doing this. Okay? It's very hard to say very much doing that. Okay? But when you have language, you're able to express yourself in a much richer way. And so the reason that, that um, languages came along was because they provided a much better way of doing analyses. Um, over the years, I've sort of stumbled across a number of these languages. Uh, when I was a graduate student at Berkeley, I came across ISP and S. ISP was something that came out of Princeton, developed by David Donohoe and a few friends. S is a language developed at Bell Labs by researchers there, John Chambers and his collaborators. Um, Lisa was one of my own that I put together, and it barely saw the light of day. Um, Explore is a system out of Germany. Uh, uh, commercial system, so didn't, didn't reach perhaps as widely as it could have. Lispstat was a system developed by um, Luke Turney at um, University of Minnesota originally. Uh, and then there are a few others. MATLAB is one that's less used for statistics, more for applied mathematics things. R I stumbled across at some point. And then <laughs> more recently there's a thing called Julio, which is something in the, in the MATLAB vain, but which is looking to improve performance of these things. And of course, there's a lot of other ones. These are just ones that I happen to stumble across. <coughs> now, in order to talk much about computing languages, I'm going to have to take you down the rabbit hole with me. I've got my own particular little interest down there, and it's got a big vocabulary, so we have to learn a few words. I'm going to talk about R here because it provides kind of a leading brand in statistical computing. Um, it's one that's fairly familiar to a lot of people, so that's the one that I'll use. I could equally be talking about other ones as well. R is an expression-based language. And what's an expression? Well, if you look down around here, you'll see that it's like a mathematical expression. It's something written in a piece of algebra. And that's the way you write the commands in R. But that's not what R sees. Okay? So internally, what R does is rearrange that input into something that looks like this. Okay? And the way this works is that the computer comes along, you've handed it this thing, and it looks at the top element here, and it says, hmm, I know what this is. This is an assignment. Okay? Something is being set equal to something else. So if I go to the left, I find the thing that's being given as a name to something is A. And if I go to the right, I find the thing that's going to be the value that's going to be associated with A. And you work your way down through this tree, evaluating bits and pieces along the way. So here I would see that this is an addition, and I'm going to add B to C. So really, this form here is immediately translated into this. And the way things work is the software actually walks, traverses that tree, um, and works out what the value of it is. Okay, so this makes R, at least conceptually, what's called a tree-walking interpreter. Now, the significance of that is that the meaning of things you can derive by interpreting them this way. Of course, to work out the answers, you're free to actually do that in any way that you'd like any equivalent way. But we'll think of R as being a tree-walking interpreter and an expression-based language. So let's look at some examples. And these are going to be big, complex examples, as you can see. We're going to add 1 and 1. And then we're going to add 1 plus a more complex expression, which is 1 and 1 in parentheses, and then another 1 as well. The answers that you get here are as you'd expect. The first one works out to be 2, and the next one works out to be 4. Okay? You evaluate things left to right, um, although order can be overwritten by parentheses. So if you've done some arithmetic, you'll know about this sort of stuff. Here's a more interesting expression. This is the kind of thing I like to play with. <laughs> so the little quotes here are because these names of things are special, plus expects to see something on one side and something on the other, indicating that you're adding these two things together. Okay, but here we are 
giving a new value to plus, and in fact, the value that we're giving to plus is minus. And that changes the results that we can expect to get. Okay? So now if we add 1 and 1, we get 0. <laughs> and if we add 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1, we also get 0. Um, there are a few of us who like to play these games and see what's going on with these things. Now let's look at a slightly more complicated example again. Okay, so this one's a bit trickier. It's basically like the one plus one plus one in parentheses plus one example. But at the beginning, on the far left there, I've changed the value of plus to minus. Okay. So in the spirit of Hadley Wickham's one minute quizzes that we had a few weeks ago, I'd like you to take a minute to guess what the answer to that might be. So I'll give you a minute to think about it. Time's up. Let me show you the answer. <laughs> Who got it? Okay, well, to understand why that is, we need to look at the tree. And the way this works is we start at the top and we ask, what is this thing at the top? It's plus. What does plus mean? It means addition. Okay? So we figured that part out. So that's regular addition. And now we go and look at the arguments to this and work out what they are. What are the things that we're adding together? Okay, so we go to the left and we find that there's another plus there. What's the meaning of plus? It's addition. Okay? And we recursively go down. Now we go to the left and we work out this particular expression, which sets plus to minus and then returns the value 1. Okay, so we've determined two pluses as being addition, and then we change the value of plus to minus, and we work out this part. So these ones here are actually involved in a subtraction, 1 minus 1. So the 1 plus 1 comes from this one, and that one giving us two, and these ones cancel. Um, so these are fun games that you can play with computer languages. And I'm going to use this to introduce the idea of dynamic languages. Okay, so computer languages come in a variety of forms. One particular form is called dynamic, and in dynamic languages, things are allowed to change. In particular, you can change the values associated with names. Okay, so we changed plus to minus in that last example. In other situations, you can change the types associated with things. So sometimes a variable can be an integer, sometimes it's real, sometimes it's a character string, something else. In contrast with that, there are static languages, and in static languages, the changes that you can make are much more restricted. Okay, so the values that you associate with a name may be limited in type. So you might say, this variable x can only contain real numbers. Okay, and if you try to assign something else to that, you'll get an error message. Um, at the more extreme end of the scale, there are very static languages where once you've assigned a value to some name, you find you can't actually change that anymore. Okay, so these are called static single assignment languages.
R is a very dynamic language. It's at the extreme dynamic end of things. You can change anything pretty much at any time. So we saw that in the example. Halfway through evaluating the expression, plus changed into minus. Okay. Here we're just looking at things that can be assigned to a particular variable. It can be a number. It can be a character string. It can be a function. It can be an evaluation environment, which is like a little dictionary where you can look up values of, um, that are attached to names. And in this case, A is an entry in its own dictionary, which makes things even more interesting. And you can change things by making them go away completely. You can remove variables. Um, sometimes that's useful, sometimes it's not. Now, the result of this is that ch you can make these changes, but the effect of the changes may not be that obvious. And we saw that in that little addition example. We made some changes midway through evaluating something. And the consequence of this is that every time you want to know what the value of something is, you have to look it up. You can't assume it's the same as a minute ago. It could have changed. And R can do very extreme things to you. If you call a function, that function can reach up and change any variables that you happen to be relying on. So you better be sure about what's going inside, going on inside these functions because they can do very nasty things to you. One of the things about dynamic languages is that they tend to be slow. And they're slow because they're always looking up values for things. Um, if I had an analogy, um, imagine you were reading a book and you had a special kind of dictionary and the dictionary told you what the meanings of words were, but these were constantly changing. Okay, so every time you encountered a word, you would have to look its meaning up in the dictionary. And you can imagine how slow that process would be. Okay, so computer languages exist on this spectrum, going from the dynamic on one end to the very static on the other. The R language sits at the extreme left of this picture. It's a very dynamic language. That means it's very flexible because you can change things in pretty much any way you like. On the other hand, it's very slow because you are consistently looking things up. There are other reasons why R is slow as well, and we'll touch on those in a bit. So the work that I'm going to talk about tonight is about moving where the language sits from the extreme dynamic end of the spectrum slightly more towards the static. So we're just going to make things a little bit more predictable um, and hopefully make things a bit faster as well. Okay, so the reason, part of the reason that our um, programs run slowly is because R is very dynamic. That's not the only reason. Another reason is that R is implemented as a tree walking interpreter and so it is actually doing this, holding a tree in memory and then walking around the tree working out what various pe pieces of it evaluate to. Um, both those things are minor, uh, introduce minor amounts of slowness. What's more of a problem is the fact that R is called by value. Okay? And this says that if you pass an aggregate thing into a function to operate on it, say you pass it into a, uh, into a function that does some sort of statistical analysis, that is not allowed to change the values of things that are passed in there. The only way to avoid that is generally to make copies and work on the copy. And that's the problem with R in general, is that you're not operating on the originals, you're making copies and operating on the originals. Now that's an accidental choice, I think. It goes back to where the S language came from, and it was developed when computers were much smaller, all the data sets sat out on disk, and when you needed to do anything with them, you copied them in. So the copying was automatic there. And that was sort of built into the language from that point on, and R inherited that from, from those languages. Another thing that makes R slow is that it doesn't have genuine scalars. So when you type something like one, that doesn't mean the number one. That is a container, a vector, containing that number one. 
Okay? So when you do calculations, you are never operating on the numbers. You're always operating on boxes containing the numbers, and you always have to reach in and take the numbers out, do whatever you want to, make another box, put the result into that box. Okay? So there's an awful lot of this boxing and unboxing of values going on. If you want to do something that is purely a scalar computation on numbers, that makes things very slow. So what we're going to do then is to look at a new language, which is kind of like R. It's in the same space. It does the same kind of things. Um, as you might notice, this language is called B in quotes. The quotes are important because there was already a language called B, which followed on from BCPL and then became C. So the quotes are important. And the quotes here stand for Brendan because this is a computer language that Brendan has been developing for his PhD. The idea here is that we want to make something which is like R, so you can do the same kinds of things. But it's a compiled language, and compiled means that instead of walking the tree, you can actually reduce it down into simple instructions that can be executed very quickly. Um, what we want to do is keep it flexible enough for interactive use, so you can use it the same way as I. You're not constrained in what you can do with it. But we want to move from the extreme dynamic end of things, so where you can change anything at any time, to slightly more towards the static. Okay, so bring a little bit of order um, to this chaotic world that you have in R. Um, so, for example, you can declare the types of things. So you can give the computer information about what is contained in a particular variable. So I can say this is going to be a real number, and the computer will be able to assume that that is always the case that's not going to get changed from under it. When you give this information, then things will be faster because the computer can make assumptions about what things are and operate on them directly rather than having to carry out checks. Um, another feature is to add scalars. So individual numbers as opposed to collections of numbers in a vector. And this will help make calculations fast. And finally, we're going to make aggregate objects passed by reference, not by value. And that means when I pass something into a function that's going to operate on it, it gets the original and it works on the original. There's no copying involved. Okay? And that will eliminate an awful lot of work, which is often unnecessary in R. So here's the full list of things that were changed in making this new language. We're going to eliminate first-class environments. Those are the little dictionaries that you look up values in. Um, that will simplify a lot of things. We'll eliminate a feature in R called lazy evaluation, where expressions are not actually evaluated until the value is needed. Um, well, at least for function arguments. Um, We'll eliminate the ability to evaluate things on the fly, okay? non-standard evaluation. Uh, we'll use pass by reference, I mentioned that, scalar values, more static, and explicit typing so we can type things and the language is compiled. Okay? So a few years ago, I handed Br Brendan this project and said, you know, in, the, uh, in the parlance of Star Trek, make it so. <laughs> <laughs> And that's what he's been working on. Okay, now I might say, at this point, you are going to see me gliding serenely over the surface of a language, like a swan. What you're not going to see is Brendan's feet underneath the surface, paddling <laughs> furiously to make it work. Uh, so from my point of view, this is easy stuff. But from his point of view, not so much. So let's have a look at a a function in this language. Well, first of all, let's take the R version. Okay, so this is as you would type this particular function in R. What it does is not that important. It computes factorials, and it's a recursive implementation of factorials. 
Okay, but you would type it this way, with one proviso. A lot of silly people think assignment is indicated by less than minus. You're wrong. <laughs> John Chambers, a long time ago, built the equals operator into R, and I'd rather uh, type one symbol instead of typing two, and there's other technical reasons why you should use equals instead. Okay, so an R function, that's how you do it. Let's look at the same function in the new language. Spot the difference? <laughs> it's the same, okay? So we're not aiming to make huge changes to what people see here. Okay, although this is a very carefully chosen example. <laughs> it doesn't have any local variables, so you don't see any declarations. Um, but we can give information to the computer about what's going on here. Okay, so if I want to, I can specify the types of things. Okay, so I can say the argument to the function n now has to be an integer. Okay, not only that, the function itself returns an integer because we know that factorials take integer values. Okay, so this is the type of the function. This is the type of the argument n coming in. Okay. Just to indicate that there is potentially some difference here. It's not identical. Um, in order to talk about the next thing, which is declarations, we have to um, know a little bit about how R works. Variables in R are created by assignment. So I can say A equals 10. Before I said that, there was no A. Okay? It was just not there. When I assigned a value to it, it came into existence and it was a variable sitting there. Okay? Now, that doesn't happen in many computer languages. Okay? Usually, the act of creating a variable somewhere to store things or a name for things, is separated from the process of giving them values. Those are two separate things. Okay. And that produces, the fact that these two things are combined in R produces some very strange results. Okay. So here's another little piece of R code. I assign the value 10 to x, and then I have a function and inside the function, if a random number is bigger than a half, so half the time, x will get set equal to 20, and then the function returns the value of x. And the question is, what is x? Is it a global variable, or is it a local variable? And the answer is, it's random. Okay? Half the time it's global, and half the time it's local, and you don't know which. That's not a nice feature to have in a computer language. It makes it unpredictable. Okay? I can't assume that I always go to the same place to get the value of x. Sometimes it's up here, and sometimes it's down there, and I have to figure out which of those two it is. Um, this is particularly problematic for compilation, because there you need much more regularity in things. So, we have to think about how we can declare variables. Okay, well, we'll go back to R, and here is another function declared in R. Again, what this does doesn't really matter that much, but what it's doing is evaluating the exponential function by summing up terms of the power series. Okay, so it's just a straight mathematical computation. In R, this is how I would do it. I've got variables n term, old sum, and new sum. And I know that they're variables because they're assigned values here. So they are local variables within this function. In the new language, we actually have to declare the fact that these are local. So in the new language, it would look like this. So all we've really done here is changed a few characters. Okay, semicolons have become commas, and we've got a VAR at the front of this list of assignments. 
Okay, so what I'm trying to convince you here is actually this is fairly lightweight. We're making fairly small, apparently superficial changes. We can do more here though. We can give more information to the computer. We can say what these things are. Some of these things, well, all of them in this case, are actually double precision floating point numbers. They are numbers that we can compute on. Now that the computer knows that, it can make some assumptions about how they are to be manipulated. Um, we are going to assume, well, we can figure out that things like plus can't change because they are constant. You're not allowed to reassign those things. Okay, so lots of assumptions can be made, and so now things can hopefully be sped up. Um, and I guess the, the big news today is actually it works. <laughs> Brendan having told me that he's getting performance increases over R of factors of about 4 to 10 over compiled R code. I think that's right. So that's you know, perhaps 16 to 100 times faster than raw R code. Um, so we're getting somewhere with this. Another thing to worry about in using R is that there's an enormous amount of copying that goes on. Again, you know, you pass an array into something, it's copied before it's operated on. Now, most people don't actually see this, but when they do find out what's going on, um, it's fairly terrifying. So here's a very simple example, and this is one that would come up in fitting a regression model to some data, so straight lines, analysis variance, that sort of thing. And what we're doing here is taking the columns of a matrix. So I take the jth column out of a matrix, big thing that looks like this, and I subtract off a multiple of another column. Okay. There's more work going on here than you would suspect. First of all, I can't operate directly on X. I'm having to pull out a piece of it. So this pulls a column out of X. And this pulls a column out of X. And now we do some arithmetic by multiplying this column by a constant. That produces a new column. Okay? And then we do subtraction of these things. And that produces a new column. So all up, we've now got four copies of this one column from the matrix. And R is doing this sort of thing all the time. You are pulling out pieces of things, using them for just a second, and then you drop them on the floor. So in this case, you would be getting four copies of the column when you actually don't need any of them. Now, that's not strictly true in this case because you can recognize that once you've used this particular column, you don't need it anymore, so you can recycle it. So you could actually write A times the values in there back into there, and you could do the same thing for the subtraction, but there's no way of eliminating the initial copy of one column to two, of the first two columns. So one thing we'd like to be able to do in the new language is to get rid of these array computations and replace them with scalar computations. Um, so here, rather than pulling out big chunks of things and operating as big chunks, which is producing lots of these garbage arrays, we're actually going to use a loop and do it element by element. Okay? Now, with all the correct declarations in place, this shouldn't produce any garbage. So there isn't any copying going on here. You're making use of machine registers and things like that to keep things very fast. Now, whether or not this is going to be a good thing to do, we're not sure, because operating on big chunks of information like columns is a very fast thing to do. That's got to be balanced against the fact that you are continually allocating stuff and throwing it away. So there's a balance to be struck here. And that's, you know, what, that's one of the interesting questions in research, is what's the right way to do things, or what are the right idioms of the language to use? And for people who know a little bit about R, um, I'll go back to something that 
Hadley was talking about a few weeks ago, and that was the question of whether or not to use drop when accessing array elements or chunks of arrays. There's an ambiguity in R if you are saying, let get the element at a particular position in an array, in this case a matrix. Does that mean that you want the number there, or does that mean that you want a container, a little matrix containing that number? Now, in R, you can't get the numbers out. Everything always exists in a container. So you have to say which of these two things you want, and the way you say it is by saying drop the array attributes or keep them. So the first one gives you the actual element in there, and the second one gives you a square thing which is one by one containing that number. Now this is actually relatively expensive because optional arguments have to be matched. Okay, so when you do something like this, even if the drop's not there, you still have to go through the matching process. That makes this kind of operation very expensive, well, fairly expensive. So it would be nice if you didn't have to worry about that. So in the B language, this doesn't happen. Okay, because if I use scalar subscripts like this, this says, give me the scalar element. If I use vector subscripts like these ones, that says, give me the array containing that. But it's actually a lot more flexible than that. Oh, I have to say, um, one thing that drives me nuts when students come to see me is when they do things like write C of 1. Okay, because what is that? That's a vector containing the number 1. But what is 1? 1 is a vector containing the number 1. <laughs> uh, so all you've done is done unnecessary work in doing this. But you can understand exactly what they mean, because conceptually those things are different. Okay. Now we have a much more flexible way of extracting pieces of information out of these matrices. Okay. So I can either get out subarrays, or I can get out plain vectors, or I can get out scalars. Okay. There's no additional argument here. So there's no speed penalty for doing this. And that's really nice. It's you know, conceptually elegant, it's very flexible, I can do all kinds of stuff, and it's fast as well. Um, other language things we have to consider, well, let's talk about call by reference. This is again about the copying thing. Um, more in this case about function calls. The costs of this are enormous. When you fit a regression model, you'll find that the design matrix, which you don't actually get to see anyway, but which is a hugely expanded version of the data, gets copied something like six or seven times. Okay. So you've got this huge amount of data being copied an enormous number of times, and it's really unnecessary. The only reason it happens is because R insists on copying things even when it's really not that necessary. The biggest place where this is a problem is for data frames, and data frames are just the statistical model of what data looks like. It's a rectangular array, and you have a list of variables across the top, and you have individual cases as the rows. Okay, another name for this is a spreadsheet. <laughs> so it's a fairly, fairly fundamental data thing, but these things get copied like you wouldn't believe even the simplest computations. Okay, so if I set a single element of a data frame to a value, that duplicates the entire data frame twice. Um, so you want to indicate something's missing, you have to copy everything twice in the process of doing this. And the problem is that the code that does the manipulation of these things is written in R, and R copies its brains out doing these things. If you could somehow go down to a deeper level, and that's done with matrices and vectors and arrays, then you wouldn't incur this overhead. So if somebody was willing to write the whole of the data frame um, 
functionality and see everything would be fine, but nobody wants to do that because um, it's kind of ugly. Uh, by contrast, B uses reference semantics, which means that you never pass copies, you always pass the original thing. And then you just make changes in it and um, you, know, you can get the results of the computations with a lot less effort. Now in the new language that's not going to happen because everything is just passed by reference. Um, but there are some problems to do with the dynamic versus static aspect of languages. Okay, so again, I'm assuming a little bit of familiarity with R. Here is a computation on a data frame. Remember this is a spreadsheet that you're doing the calculation on. And in that spreadsheet you're going to operate on a couple of columns to produce a new column. Now, in this, where do these variables come from? Okay. Do they come from the data frame, or are they the ones that I defined up here? Okay, now, the problem in the new language is that these thing, this has to be compiled. So this has to be understood ahead of time before you actually apply it to any data. So in fact, before you've actually read this data frame in. So you don't know whether it's got an X or a Y in it. Okay. So there are some tricks that you have to do in order to actually make this work. Um, we're starting to run out of time, so I won't bore you with the details too much. But essentially, you compute, you, you turn the expressions in here into a function, and then make the, the, uh, the values you need arguments of that function. So these are you know, the kind of fun games that we enjoy playing. Let's skip that. OK, so given that we're celebrating my imminent death here, <laughs> <laughs> I thought I might make a few general comments about statistical computing research. Basically, just to get it off my chest at this point. The first one is that we need new statistical computing software. Okay. Nothing is ever perfect, and boy, that's true about R. Um, it has an awful lot of success, but people are beginning to notice that it's slow, that it doesn't handle vast data sets very well. Okay. Now, to some extent, we've been bailed out by Moore's law. Computers have been getting so much faster that people haven't noticed how slow it is. This year's machine is four times faster than last, so everything appears to be going faster. But if you do actually handle big data sets, then you are starting to notice it. Um, of course, you can enhance the thing, and that's been happening. Uh, but at the risk of offending lots of people, let me say, it doesn't matter how much lipstick you put on it. <laughs> it's still a pig. <laughs> I guess this could be interpreted as modesty, but <laughs> it's a little more critical than that. Second thing that may not be so obvious is I think that we need a multiplicity of these things. Okay? We don't just need one kind of computer system that everybody uses. As an academic, I think we need lots of them, and we need the competition, and we need the cooperation. We need new ideas coming on stream. And at the moment, R has kind of won the battle. Okay? And there have been some very good computer systems for doing statistics that have kind of perished as a result of this. And I think that's a very, very sad thing. Um, the ones I would mention in particular are um, the S system, which has kind of disappeared because R has eaten its cake. Um, there's also Lisp stat, which was produced by Luke Turney, which had some very, very interesting things in it. Um, and another system called Omega Hat by Duncan Temple Lang, again, kind of perished 
because R kind of took over the space. Um, and that's unfortunate. Okay. So why don't we just hand it over to the computer scientists? They know about this stuff. We are just rank amateurs. Well, the problem is they mess it up because they don't do statistics. They don't know what these things are used for. We are the domain experts. We can offer advice on that. Okay, now, I often try and do this. You know, I will accost a computer scientist and explain the problem to them, and they will run screaming from the room. Um, <laughs> because like many academics, what they want is little bite-sized problems that they can solve and write a paper on and get it out there and move on to the next thing. And well, these problems, the problems of developing these systems are not like that. It's a big, hard task that you're taking on. Okay, development of, of these kinds of systems is, is hard. R itself um, took, I think, nearly 20 years before it suddenly became an overnight success. <laughs> and there were a lot of people working during that time, working very hard on it. So there's an awful lot of work to do. At the beginning, you don't need all those hands, but you need at least a couple of people to be working on these things. Okay? Because working on your own, the problem is just too big. Um, you are too focused on what you're doing. You don't actually see the big picture for, um, because you're concentrating so hard on the development of little things. Um, despite this, working on these new systems is fun, or at least for somebody like me, it's fun. Um, other people's mileage may differ, I guess. Uh, but if you are the sort of person who gets involved in this stuff, it's actually fun and it's fulfilling. And if I had to describe it, it's like having your own playground. Right? And so you have a, a playground called R, and you walk around that for a decade or so, and you get to know it pretty well. And there are some broken glass in this pile over here and there are some big spiky trees over here and you know to avoid those things and there's a deep hole over here and you, <laughs> you know that you have to step over that but it all gets fairly comfortable right? uh, and routine but then you find one day that there's actually a little gate at the back of this playground and you can walk through and there's a new playground um, and the, suddenly the fun is back there are new things to try, there are new things to do, and you know, you cast around and there are these spiky cactuses over there and you know that you should probably avoid those, and big unbalanced rocks over here that'll fall on you, but you know, you, you get used to that kind of thing and it's fun. And finally, the thing we really need is for people to get involved in this. Now, as I said, I've tried to involve computer scientists from time to time, and it's an unfamiliar problem for them, um, so they don't really know how it's going to get used, and so they feel a little bit insecure about that, even though they have all the skills to take these, this kind of work on. So it would be nice to involve them, but we also need our own people. Okay? So we need people in statistics to be involved in this kind of thing. And one of the unfortunate things is that a lot of us got interested in this field at about the same time, right? So back in the 70s and 80s, I guess. And we're fast approaching our use-by dates at this point. Um, and there are much fewer in the way of young people and fewer people who actually have the experience of building these systems from scratch. There are people who will come in and work on a project like R and contribute, but they don't have the experience of building them from scratch, and we need these new systems. Okay, so there are one or two exceptions to this, and I would like to point out my collaborator on this, my PhD student, Brendan McArdle, who will be finishing soon. <laughs> and we'll be in the market for a job. <laughs> <laughs> I can see his father applauding. <laughs> um, 
So let me just hang that out there. Um, the skills are available if you're interested. Um, I'm not expecting anyone in this room to be putting up their hand, but maybe there's a wider audience that we're streaming to who may have something to contribute there. Anyway, so this, this is a brief look at research in statistical computing, talking about you know, the kinds of things that I do and that Brendan does, and a few of the people who work in R are doing at the moment. So hopefully it's been enlightening, perhaps a little challenging for some people, um, but there it is. Hey, you took up the time at the start. No, this is my fault. <laughs>